Hi, welcome to our web event on x-ray microscopy. Now the subject of the first of our series is x-ray vision. I'm John Genke and I'm standing here in Madison, Wisconsin. It's a bit frigid out here so hopefully it's warmer where you're at. Now x-ray vision, it's one of those superpowers uh, that, that was actually probably one of the first. You know, flying, being able to leap over buildings, and being able to see through objects. Uh, certainly through your skin or, or through a building. Now, the ability to see through things, just x-ray imaging in general, has been around for quite a while. A uh, hundred years. And it's been used in medical x-rays for a very, very long time. Now to take that though to the next dimension, took a lot of calculations, a lot of computations, and now that computers have caught up, taking x-ray imaging to the three-dimensional level as possible. Now we're all familiar with how you can go to the doctor and get a CT scan or computed tomography. In that case, you're going to be maybe laying on a bed and then they're going to collect these images all around you at different angles and reconstruct what your insides look like. Now x-ray microscopy uses the same technology as micro CT, as CT, but on a smaller scale with much higher resolution. We also can use x-rays with very high power so that we can penetrate objects that are made of metal or rock. Now how does it actually work? Well it's pretty quite, it's really quite simple. We have a source, we have the sample, and then we have a detector. The source is going to emit some high energy light and that's just what x-rays are. They're just a higher energy version of you know, the light that we use uh, every day. And they have that ability to penetrate objects. Now if an object is denser, then it's going to attenuate the x-rays more. If it's lighter, it's going to allow more x-rays to pass through. So we place a two-dimensional detector on the other side of that object, and then we're actually able to capture that image. Now by capturing a sequence of these images as we rotate the sample, we're able to reconstruct what the interior looks like. And this technology is used by a whole variety of different fields. The fact that it's non-destructive, it makes it perfect for people looking to keep the sample in pristine condition. And this could be in a failure analysis case in industry, or for an archaeologist who wants to preserve an artifact. I've brought several samples with me today so that we can test out this technology. And so I'm going to head into the building and talk with Dave uh, about this technology. Hi Dave. Hi John, what do you got for me today? So I've brought in some samples so that we could try to explore the different things that x-ray microscopy could uncover for us. Great, let's get started. So the first thing is a mandarin orange. Nice, I've done a lot of uh, images of food these days. It's um, kind of an um, interesting topic that there's a lot of emphasis going on uh, towards looking at the inside quality control on food items. Yeah, I mean, we hear quite a bit about food safety. It's one of those things that's uh, becoming more and more important. Yeah, yeah. I mean, with an x-ray microscope, we can see on the inside, we can see all the slices, thickness of the skin. We can see if there's anything, bruises, things like that all show up uh, with the XRM. And in that quality control scenario, I mean, how quickly would you be able to scan something like that? Oh, I can scan uh, an orange like this in 10 minutes max. Oh, okay. Wow. So... The next thing I brought in was a small figurine. Oh, that's fun. So, yeah, I actually picked this up when I was in Belgium last time. Yeah, great. Something like that. You could look at um, how it's made, the construction. Um, is the material, is it different woods for different parts? Are there any pins in there? Um, yeah, I mean, I think it's wood, but, you know, you never know nowadays if this is a resin or something like that, right? They sure. They fake it pretty well. So yeah. I'd be very interested in knowing, it. is it wood and, yeah, how it was constructed. Great. So the next thing that I've brought in is a thumb drive. Yeah, and that's interesting. Yeah, I'm kind of interested just to you know see what it looks like, see if we're able to uh, shoot through some of these heavier metal pieces in there. Yeah, it should be no problem. We can see the chip and see the wiring and all the connectors. Um, you can see you know the board. Is it a single board, double board? Um, look at all the solder joints. Yeah. So then the next thing we have, another hot area, um, yeah, batteries. Yeah, hot topic these days. Everyone is, there's a lot of battery research. Make it smaller, make it fa uh, hold more uh, energy. Yeah, batteries work great. Um, 
you get good shots of the anode, the cathode, um, material on the inside. If it's a layered material, you can see all the various layers. If there's any defects or delaminations with the um, electrodes on the inside. And it's kind of my understanding that these can vary quite a bit on their interiors. Oh yeah, you, you never know. Is it going to be a traditional battery? Is it going to be a stack of batteries? Or, um, you know, like a computer battery is going to be a, a layered material. So yeah, there's a lot of variations of what happens okay. inside uh, the batteries. And we'll be able to shoot through it without a problem? Yeah, yeah no problem. Okay. Yeah. And then the last sample is a small pill. Oh yeah. Now there's something that's really important. A lot of a lot of uh, companies now are going to XRMs for QA, QC, uh, inspect the pills, the fill, how much is in there, is the active ingredient equally distributed, things like that. Okay. So now looking kind of at this, these different sample types, which instrument do you think would work well to be able to measure this? Oh, the 1275 would measure all these. Okay. Oh, great. Yeah. And that's the one with the push button on the front, Yeah, right? absolutely. It's got a push button. So you can either operate it in standard manual mode, or if like the other day I had 12 identical samples, I can program the whole system, and then I just push a button, and it runs the same, the sam every sample the same exact way every time. So if you have an, multiple operators or you have multi, you know, the same sample gets run every day, you can just be set up for push button mode. All right, that sounds great. Um, so I guess I'll connect up with you later and maybe you could show me the results. Yeah, let all me right. scan all these items and then uh, I will give you a call. Sounds great, Dave. Thanks. Thanks for bringing them by today, John. Well, it looks like John's brought me some uh, bunch of samples today. Let me take a look at them. Okay. Mounting samples with the XRM is actually very easy. It's one thing I like about it. There's very little sample prep. Um, when you go to mount samples, whenever you get a um, XRM from us, you'll get a sample stage kit. It's a series of brass plates and pins that you allow you to mount the sample, put them on the instrument. So, let me start with the orange, my biggest sample. So, orange is pretty straightforward, easy to, easy to image, easy to mount. Let me just grab the largest plate. You could just image it just like that. I do stuff like that occasionally, but one of the problems you'll get with the XRM is the shadow. The, so the brass being so much more dense than the orange, They'll cast a shadow. You might lose a little bit of resolution on the bottom of the orange. So I want to lift it off the plate a little bit. A couple ways of doing it. This plastic cup seems to work great. Just drops right in there. Now I have a nice gap in here between the orange and the brass plate. Um, the plastic being very low density is not going to show up or you can um, edit it out. It's actually fairly easy. In this case, you won't see it at all. My Hunter. He is actually almost an ideal mounting sample. He's got a nice flat bottom. It's important with XRM that your sample be mounted securely. You don't want it to move, to wobble, or fall off. And I have had samples fall off in the middle of a run. It doesn't hurt the instrument in any way, but you do lose your run and you know you have to repeat some stuff. So I'm gonna go to something like this smaller brass uh, plate. Um, gonna stick right on there. Um, I wanted to mount it securely. So um, what I'm gonna do is I like to use something uh, like dental wax, just a very low density uh, plastic wax. I'm gonna mount him nice and securely get him evenly centered. He's not going to fall off in the instrument. He is ready to go. Okay. What was my nerd one? Third one. There we go. So we have our jump drive. Get a lot of like little electronics like this. Again, I'm going to go with um, my brass plate. Now, some philosophy. Um, you might want to mount it flat or on its side. Um, one thing to remember about the XRM is the closer you can get the sample to the source, the higher the resolution is, okay, with geometric magnification. So in this case, if I mount my sample this way, I'm going to be able to get closer to the, to the source than if I mount it sideways. Also, 
This way gives me a little bit more uniform. It's never going to be perfectly uniform because I have a, a flat sample, so get different, uh, different absorptions. Um, if I mount it this way, I have a much greater distance or difference between the x-rays coming in and out. Um, so let's mount you up this way. Let's get you nice and square. It's important with the XRM that everything be nice and aligned down the center of rotation. You don't want your sample to wobble or process. Um, it's not the end of the world if your sample moves a little bit, but the closer you can get it to the center of rotation, you can get a little bit better uh, resolution, a little bit sharper image. Where do we go from here? Let's go with my battery. Something like the battery. See, let me use this. This is a, a plastic piece, and I do like plastic sample mount. It doesn't actually come with a kit. Someone made this for me. Um, I like it because, again, um, plastic is fairly transparent to the x-rays, at least how I'm going to be imaging it. Um, so in this case, I can just mount this in there, okay? and it's ready to go. Like I said, mount imaging or doing sample prep with the XRM is so simple. Very little sample prep. I've been doing microscopy for 25 years, um, SEM, TEM, AFM, and I've spent hundreds of hours in the sample prep room making little samples, gluing um, samples down to SEM stages. I'm ready to go. Actually, this one's a little short for my system, so I have a little extender. I can plop on there. Now he's ready to go. A little bit of wobble there. Let's see. Oh, yeah. The pill. Kind of small, light. I think the pin will work best for this. A little dab of wax on the bottom. Again, it's important to get it all lined up. A little bit of practice. You're all set and ready to go. So those are the five samples that John brought. I actually brought one of my own. Um, it's actually a, a centrifuge tube. And in this case, I've got some tiny beads. So I've got people that bring um, uh, powders, small crystals, or small, um, other small particles, and they're looking at what is the shape, what is the size, sphericity, particle distri size distribution. In that case, something like this is great. I can just pour the sample into here, and then I will just, again, mount it. And I'm ready to go. I really like this sample. This is a, a great test sample, testing out the software. Um, It'll count all the beads. It'll give you nice distributions. So I have prepped six samples, a couple of minutes. Let's, this, let's get these guys on the instrument and see what they look on the inside. Well, it looks like John's sample is done. Let me get the orange off of there. The next sample I'm going to run is... Um, the pill. The pill is a great sample for um, push button mode. Um, you're probably going to be running a lot of samples if this is where you're running. It's small. It's, it's um, you know pretty simple to load. So in push button mode, I have all the parameters preloaded, and all I have to do is hit push. Hit push the start button. It does everything. It closes the door. It adjusts the stage position to the exact position I wanted it. In this case, I think I've set it for 12 microns. So the stage is lowering. It's moving towards the source. And now we're scanning. That's really all there is to push button mode. Once you collected your data, though, the next software you're going to use is something called nRecon. So that's, that's the reconstruction software. So you're going to take hundreds, if not thousands, of slices. These are 2D slices. So this is the part of the software that 
you use to make subtle modifications, say you had some slight drift, and, um, and then you'll reconstruct your software. It's really straightforward. It's a couple of buttons. Um, it takes minutes to learn. Once you get that done, I like to jump into Data Viewer. Here I have a battery loaded. So Data Viewer is a great program to do a nice, quick look at your data. So I can see that I've got my electrode. Here's the outside of the battery, the cap seal. Um, I got a defect. I can just click on this defect and then I have it in different views. I can click anywhere actually on the screen. So the red line is this line. So I have a blue cut, that's this, and I have the green cut on that side. And this is actually something where I'd actually do like, want to do some quick measurements, I can do quick measurements in there. Once I get this done, I jump into CTVox. And CTVox is the show me. This is where the oohs and the ahs, where you actually get cool data. And here I have my um, orange loaded. You can see, I can grab it, I can move it around. Okay? Obviously it's false color. Um, XRM does not give you color. I colored it orange. But what's cool about this is I'm gonna grab a plane and I'm gonna gradually move it through. And I'm basically taking slices away. And you can see the individual um, slices of the orange show up. Let me grab it. I can zoom in and you can actually see everything on the inside move. Okay. And you can see you have the skin, you have the white pulpy layer. If you had pits, the pits would show up nice. Okay. This is actually a great program. And you gotta remember, this is not a three-dimensional solid at this point. What you're looking at is a, what we call a voxel cloud. So you, all of these are individual pixels, X, Y, Z, and grayscale, orange scale for us right now. And, and it's actually amazing that your mind actually puts it all together into a three-dimensional image. But at this point, it really is just a three-dimensional image, or a three-dimensional voxel cloud. If you wanted to create surfaces, um, we have a program called CTVol, which is actually will generate the surfaces that can be exported out to say like a 3D printer, okay? And then finally, we have something called CTN or CT analysis. Um, this is the, the part of the software that we use if we wanted to do more complex measurements, if we wanted to take various regions of insurance, we want to do particle counting, we wanted to do defect counting, things like that. This would be the part of software that we would use. Let's see. We've got about a minute left, 45 seconds left on my scan. So I'll tell you a little bit more about this. Um, so this is actually um, a useful program and it'll actually do, if you need 2D, you do 3D. Here I'm doing slices and it's, it's color coded or grayscale coded by the size of the balls. Um, but then there's also this thing called uh, morphometry which allows you to do a much more complex uh, version of imaging where there's um, dozens of parameters that you can use to um, manipulate, smooth, enhance different parts of the soft, of the different part of your data, or grab a region of interest that you wanna look. It's also got a cool feature of this, which is called Watershed, which allows you to, the software goes through and actually deconnects every single one of these balls. So it allows you to do a lot more advanced analysis. Okay, so my pill just finished up. So this data will then get loaded up on the re and recon. The next sample I'm gonna be run is this hunter. Let's load him in. Okay. Let's see what he looks like. Okay, x-rays on. Detector on. And there's my guy. Actually, here's his feet. Let me pull him down into view. Cool. I'm going to back him off a little bit. He's still a little bit too big, out of scale. So I'm actually going to try to do a connected scan, a multiple scan type imaging. So I can go over here and I can do something called a, a scout scan. And it's going to do a quick scan through the object. 
as it moves the stage up and down. So the stage rotates to do your imaging, but also has the ability to, to move up and down. So you can center your sample exactly where you want it to center. Okay, it finished up the scout scan. So here's my guy, and I want to image him from head to toe. And it says, do you want to do an oversized scan? Yes. And, and the software automatically loads it. It says, I want to do a connected scan with two parts. So I set the number of steps. Let me give him a name. I can do 360 or 180. 360 would be if you had a more complex sample, maybe some electronics like I did with the USB. That would you want a 360 scan. This is a fairly simple object because the attenuations are pretty low. It's a pretty light object. So I'm going to need a, just a 1 in 180 degree scan. It, the stage has some motion and I'm just going to hit scan. Now there's another mode instead of doing the stitched mode where it takes two images and stitch them together, I also have a mode called um, spiral scan. So in a spiral scan mode, I'm actually going to take my sample and instead of just doing two images, I'm actually going to start it at the bottom and slowly rotate my sample up through the detector field of view. And that makes one long continuous um, series of x-rays and then the software knows how to reconstruct it. That's actually a better technique if you're going to be using um, more dense objects or you have an object that has a lot of um, planes in, in it. Um, that's the way to go. And I'll even do spiral scan even if they'll fit in one scan if I have one of these complex images. Well, the state is almost done. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, get John on the phone and show him the data. Hi, Dave. How'd the samples go? Good. Hi, John. Hey, they went great. I bet you want to see what they look like. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm really excited to see kind of this whole range of materials and if you were to use that superpower of x-ray vision to see inside. Yeah, I was. Um, so um, I think we started off with the, uh, we, dished, we saw the orange. Let's skip ahead to the pill. Um, so okay. I've got the pill up on the screen. I hope you see it well. Yep. Yeah. So, and now, so you were able to run this one just with that push button mode, right? Right. This is just the push button mode. So you can see, I can see the outer structure. You can see that the, the, the pill capsule is actually the highest density material. Um, and then there's a, lots of things inside. And what you'd be interested in is the active ingredient, correct? That's right. Yeah. I think in this case, we'd, we'd want to know kind of that distribution of the active ingredient. And you right. know, of course, the smaller the particles, then the, the, more, the quicker the uptake would be in that case. Correct. And you want to make sure, yeah, you have the right amount. So I would actually go into a program called CTN. Okay. So let me pull that up. So here's what I've done is, so here's a cross section through your data. And oh, I can, yeah. I've highlighted all the high density material. Well, your, your shell is not, the capsule is not something you want to look at. So what I can actually do is mask it out. Okay. So, so here you have just the capsule or just, just the active ingredients. So now I can run um, a program that will actually go through and identify each of these individual active ingredients particles, um, calculate their X, Y, Z and size, and then I can get a, a particle distribution as far as size and a particle distribution as far as how they fit inside. Are they equally distributed? Things like that. Oh, wow. So mm. now what about the, uh, the little hunter statue, the, the oh, little yeah. figurine? He was great. Let me pull him up. So here we have the hunter. Um, okay. So I've got him colored now by um, density. So blue is high density, red is low density. And actually, with this case, um, turns out that the um, uh, uh, painting with the paint is like really the high dense material. So oh, wow. So it's yeah. a, it seems to be a lot denser actually than the wood. Yeah. If I if I if I cut into him. You know, basically, the, uh, I have it, you know, set up. So, uh, see, you can, the inside is just the very, very, you know, mm -hmm. faint. So, it's way down here on the far left, which would be the low density side of your material. The gun's actually very low dense as well, but he's, he wasn't, the, the gun wasn't painted. Now, could you actually quantify the thickness of that paint layer? Absolutely. Um, go into a program called Data Viewer. So here now I have um, a cross section through the guy. So right through the middle. And you can see, okay. you can see the density, the high density of the paint. No matter where I click, you can see him, right? Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so if I wanted to measure the thickness of this paint here, I can just draw a line across it. 
And there I go. Okay. So let me draw a little bit smaller line. So 20 to 40, so you're looking about a 20 micron um, paint coating here. Oh, wow. Uh, wow. So that's, that seems, I mean, that seems like a very precise value. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And actually, it's pretty reproducible throughout the whole thing. Yeah, you can go, you know, 30 to 45. This time it's like about 15 microns. And you can actually okay. see here in the corners, it actually beat it up a little bit, yes. a little bit higher density yeah. here. So you, here you have bigger blobs. So they're 20 to, you know, um, yeah, so you can we can do this. And if I wanted to, if you really wanted a um, more precise quantitative measurement, um, I could actually run this in the CTAN program again and actually get the thickness distribution, the average thickness distribution, things like that mm -hmm. from this from this uh, image. Okay, so I guess to shift gears then, then we had the um, thumb drive. And oh, yeah. Yeah, I think what would be really interesting in that case is with a complex circuit like that, would we have that resolution to be able to see things like the leads and determine if we had solder problems? Yeah, again, here is the um, XYZ data, mm -hmm. cross-sectional data, um, which is interesting. It doesn't, you know, I can give it, give it some false color, but that's not really, you know, we could do something here, but actually it turns out that the 3D is the best way to look at this one. So here you have um, your sample in 3D. So here you have the leads up in here, a chip, memory. Um, so yeah, and if you if I wanted to like study the leads in more detail, or the solder, you know mm -hmm. I could dive in. Um, see now we're getting a much higher detail look at that. Oh yeah, yeah. And look around. And it even looks like we could check for connectivity within the circuit board itself, like in the traces. Yeah, absolutely. I just uh, grab one of the sides and I could just dive in and see here we're going through one section at a time all the way through your sample. Mm -hmm. So then the last sample I brought in, that was a battery. And oh, now yeah. what I'm guessing is most of these batteries, they just kind of are a can. Maybe they have you know some wraps inside of the different anode and cathode type materials. Right. No, it was this is this was surprising. Really? Let me pull it open. Yeah. So here is your battery. Oh, it is wow. Not, yeah, that not, is. <laughs> it's not one battery. It's actually a stack of eight um, button batteries all together. Ah, uh, OK. So that's how they can get that high voltage out of this little right, battery. This, I'm assuming this is a 12 volt battery. Yeah, but you can see each individual uh, battery. You know, you could make out the details um, of, of each individual, you know, these seals right mm -hmm. here. Um, you can see, you know, um, the anodes, the cathodes, and all the packing material on the inside. So we would actually be able to tell if we had a problem with the lowest cell versus the top cell as we mm -hmm. cycle these things. Absolutely. And if there was some sort of problem on the inside, we could definitely see that as well. Oh, wow. Well, I mean, you did a really great job on these samples. I can't believe everything that we saw. Yeah. Yeah. Now, remember, I, I showed you one more sample at the end, and that was... Um, the uh, centrifuge tube full of balls. Um, oh, that's right. Yeah, that was an yeah, extra that, one that you had. Yeah, that, that's a great sample, and I use that a lot. It's a good way. Uh, um, it, it does some some calibration. And here it is. It's up in 3D. So I've got hmm. it kind of shadowed, kind of enhanced the texture. Um, yeah. And it kind of reminds thing, me of one of those old like uh, games where you'd have to guess the number of jelly beans in the jar here. Yeah. So could we use the software to do that? I can actually tell you the, how many I counted. But you can also see that there's small and large uh, balls inside here. It's not yeah, a, a, yeah, it's not, I do see that. It's not a uniform distribution. So let me count the balls and tell you the sizes. And again, I used uh, the CTAN program to do that. So I went through and again, like I did with the pill, I highlighted what I wanted. Then I used something called a watershed analysis, which actually separates the balls. So the software determines where each individual ball is. And when you do all that and then run the program, what you end up is a bunch of, of uh, uh, lines of uh, an Excel spreadsheet. But there's a lot of information there. So right now, there's 11,883 balls I counted. Oh, wow. And I've got, I've got a statistics for each and every ball, um, the size, the location. Um, so what I've got plotted out is this is the volume. And you notice that there's two peaks in there. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, so two we'll, distributions here. Right. So I got one down here about uh, eight millimeters and one up here about 1.5 millimeters. Mm -hmm. 
Uh -huh. So these are these are the two uh, the distribution of the two balls. And then over here in the green, I've got sphericity. So sphericity is how spherical it is. So if everything was perfectly spherical, I'd have just one big giant line over here at one. But I don't. I've got a gradual distribution, and then it's mainly it's fairly spherical, but um, it's still you know there's some non-sphericity in there. And there's lots of things that this will calculate: surface area, um, uh, centroids. Um, like I said, orientation, if there's a predominantly aspherical in one direction, I could go and figure that one out too. Wow. So, yeah. Wow. So these, I mean, the, sam the samples really look amazing, you know, in ranging everything from, you know, the orange, the food piece, all the way up to these, you know, higher tech, like the thumb drive and the battery. Right. So, um, you know, I guess for me coming into today, what I really was expecting was to think about this property of x-ray vision and, uh, you know, the superpower and could, does this technology allow us to have it? And I think we can really agree that, yes, it gives us that, right? Yeah. And, you know, it does make pretty pictures. So you do get this, you know, beautiful qualitative uh, image, but in the core of it, there's a, um, you get quantitative. There's a really solid application program in there to pull out all this quantitative data, like volume thickness, like uh, counting balls. So yeah, it's a very powerful program. So it actually takes you, in that respect, it takes our superpower even beyond what we had you know, seen in comic books in the past. It takes it from just that qualitative aspect of being able to see into something to we can actually quantify the distributions in those things and then use that to make decisions about how uh, you know, a company might proceed with that particular product. Exactly. You know, Pretty pictures are that. They're pretty, but a number is something I can use. Yeah. So on that note, um, thanks for joining uh, for our uh, video today to talk about uh, X-ray vision and, and see some of these in, this instrument in action. Uh, and we will be seeing you really soon.